Hi, I'm Steve Palumbi, and this is lecture four of the science of the extreme life of the sea, where we're gonna talk about the microbial loop, the, the role that microbes play in the ecology and the, the food chain of, of the ocean. And uh, the, the normal food chain that we think about in the ocean, um, we're mostly paying attention to fish that are consuming smaller fish and zooplanktons that are then uh, consuming uh, the photosynthetic algae. This whole then food chain dominates a huge part of, of the ocean, but it actually isn't that dominant because there's an entire other side to it that we seldom think about, and that's the microbial loop. Here, uh, the bacteria in the ocean um, play a huge role. Uh, in the last lecture, we talked about how many there are, uh, microbes there are, more than there are stars in the universe, the metabolic rate that they have, the role that they play in, uh, in the movement of organic carbon through ocean ecosystems. And how does that, that bacterial mass actually make it into uh, the food chain that we were thinking about earlier. Uh, well, bacteria are too small for most of the zooplankton to, to directly consume. Uh, these zooplankton eat organisms that are a little bit bigger. And so between the bacteria and the zooplankton in this part of the food chain are a set of single-celled organisms uh, that are bigger than bacteria and can consume them and are big enough for the zooplankton to consume as well. And those are ciliates and um, uh, flagellates uh, that make up a critical link between the bacterial part of the food chain and this, this other part. Uh, this is a picture of uh, different, a couple of different kinds of flagellates. Uh, they're single-celled eukaryotic um, organisms are called flagellates because they have one large flagella that beats to move them through uh, their, uh, the ocean. Um, these are just drawings of a couple of different types of uh, flagellates that are common um, in the ocean. The other kind of organism that consume bacteria and also flagellates as well, are um, ciliated protozoans. The ciliates, like, for example, paramecium, um, consume bacteria and flagellates directly by, by bringing them inside their bodies into, um, into organelles that then um, dissolve and, and consume them. Uh, they are big enough, the ciliates and some of the flagellates, for the copepods to then be able to graze on them and allowing that flow of energy from bacteria into the bacteria's predators into the rest of the, the, rest of the food chain. Um, and uh, that injects a huge amount of carbon and carbon energy into this part of the food chain because about a quarter of the Earth's uh, organic carbon is tied up in these microbes in, in the ocean. So with these uh, other steps along the way, the larger ciliates and, and flagellates, the added energy of uh, the bacterial population um, can get added to the other part of the ocean food chain. Uh, but there's another aspect of the life of bacteria that we have to take into account. It's not just these larger cells that are predators on bacteria, um, but smaller ones as well. The viruses are active predators on bacteria, uh, attaching to them and killing them and changing the dynamics of these, of these populations. So um, what we're gonna do from the rest of this lecture is talk about the relationship, this very smallest part of the food chain in the ocean between the bacteria and, and their viruses. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the relationships among viruses and bacteria um, because it's a pretty special predator-prey relationship. In, in particular, the way viruses get into uh, microbes is by attaching to receptors on the outside of those cells. The viruses have to have very specific kinds of abilities to attach to those receptors, and so there's a co-evolutionary arms race between viruses and bacteria. The <clears throat> bacteria with the right receptors are attacked by viruses, but they can evolve different receptors, which means that they are no longer attacked by those viruses. The viruses can evolve different ways of attacking uh, the evolved microbes to then be able to have access to them. So that causes an arms race between the viruses <clears throat> and the bacteria in how they relate to one another and whether the bacteria is protected from the virus or whether the, the virus can attack. 
Um, that changes the evolutionary dynamics of these species, it changes their demography and population size, and it, <clears throat> it leads to a set of very specific and kind of bizarre adaptations on the, on the side of the viruses themselves um, and on the side of the microbes. To, so to be a little bit more uh, specific, let's talk about the viral microbe relationships in Prochlorococcus. That's uh, a microbe that's very, very common in the ocean, makes up up to 10 to the 27th cells in ocean ecosystems. Uh, they're highly photosynthetic. They produce a lot of the oxygen in the ocean and, and in our atmosphere. And some of the viruses <clears throat> that attack them actually have photosynthetic genes in their genomes. Well, viruses aren't photosynthetic. They don't use those photosynthetic genes. What are they doing in the viral genome? Well, it turns out when viruses go and attack a bacteria, they inject their RNA or their DNA, and they shut down the metabolism of those cells. The cell itself shuts down its own metabolism, and particularly um, shuts down the expression of certain photosynthetic genes, well, the virus brings those genes with it, allowing those genes to be made and keeping the photosynthetic machinery of the, the captured host alive long enough to provide more energy in the cell for the viruses to use to make more copies of, of themselves. Um, so by supplying uh, new copies of the gene, it sort of thwarts the host's attempt to shut down its metabolism, it thwarts the host's attempt to starve the virus and keep it from making um, too many more, more copies. Um, we can see the action of these kinds of predator-prey dynamics in ocean ecosystems actually physically uh, by looking at the dynamics of blooms from um, <clears throat> aerial surveys or even from space. Uh, this is the bloom here off the coast of southern England of a kind of a microbe called a coccolithophore. Uh, this is uh, the picture of the coccolithophore, um, <clears throat> Milliania. And uh, this coccolithophore, this microbe, uh, coats itself in calcareous plates. That's what's shown here, these disc-like, almost flying saucer-looking plates. And because they're calcareous, uh, they look sort of chalky, and you can see that in these images from space. We can track coccolithophore blooms um, over time. This is a different, a different bloom in a different place. Uh, this started off in late May um, off the northern coast of Turkey here. Uh, about two weeks later, in mid-June, you can begin to see this entire body of water that is filling up with this chalky bloom of coccolithophores. Um, late in June, uh, there's holes that you can begin to see forming in, the, in this chalky um, bloom, and that is the, the role, or this is the, the consequences of the bloom being essentially consumed and eaten um, by viruses that are spreading. Um, and then by mid-July, this whole, the <clears throat> eastern side is much more clear than the western side, and looking at this, you can see the progression of this viral outbreak consuming this bloom of, of, <clears throat> of plankton. Um, why do they disappear? In this case, it's a virus that's infecting them, killing those individuals. Uh, every individual cell that's killed by a virus releases other viral particles into the water that then attack and, um, and kill other cells around them. Uh, well, but the cells themselves have different ways of dealing with the viruses. And one of the paradoxical ways that the cells have of dealing with the virus is once it's attacked, once it's invaded, that cell itself can undergo something called programmed cell death. That essentially the cell goes through a set of metabolic reactions that kills itself. That prevents the virus from using the cell's metabolism to turn it to turn the virus into more viral particles, and it slows the infection uh, because the infected cell isn't going to release a whole lot of viral particles out into the, the open environment. And by so doing, that individual cell essentially commits suicide, but they're clonal organisms, and so uh, the clone mates of that cell are floating around uh, in, in the water column, and so uh, the thinking is that evolutionarily, that cell, once it's infected, uh, 
by killing itself is saving its clone mates, its genetically identical copies of itself elsewhere in the water column from becoming um, infected. So another way that these cells have in responding to uh, a viral infection is to turn themselves into gametes to form the next generation free of viruses. Um, so the life cycle of a coccolithophore is that it's a diploid cell uh, surrounded by the coccolis or the, the, those um, calcareous plates I was showing you before. Um, at a certain signal, for example, if the cell gets infected by a virus, it goes through meiosis, essentially um, having the number of chromosomes. The meiosis uh, then turns, allows these cells to form gametes. The gametes can fuse together and form the diploid cells. In this case, though, the gametes are free of the virus, and so the cycle can continue um, without the viral infection that the original cell had. So the, the dynamics between viruses and microbes, um, in particular, uh, the evolutionary dynamics between them, uh, leads to a set of speculations and interesting thinking about um, how bacteria, and microbes in particular, uh, are able to be so abundantly and abundantly diverse in ocean ecosystems. Um, take a step back. Uh, viruses are not uncommon in the ocean. They're actually more common than microbes, uh, up to 10 times more viruses per milliliter of seawater than there are, than there are microbes. Uh, they go in and they burst cells. And when their hosts are very common in the water, then the viruses that are released from a burst cell don't have far to go before they can find and infect another microbe that's very similar to the host that they came from. Uh, and that means that highly abundant microbes, uh, once they get infected by a virus, that infection can spread very quickly through the population, just as we saw with the coccolithophore example. Well, we don't see too many populations of bacteria in the oceans that are that dominant over wide stretches. Even Prochlorococcus, which is the most abundant of the microbes, is only one out of every 100 cells that's, that's in the ocean. Uh, we know microbes can grow very quickly. They can form big populations. So why don't those big, huge populations of successful microbes take over the ocean? Well, maybe that example of coccolithophores being cleaned out of from the northern, um, from north of Turkey is part of the explanation. Possibly viruses come through and wipe out the most abundant microbes that are there. If you think about it, the really abundant microbes are a huge evolutionary target. Viruses that evolve the ability to identify them, attach to them, and insert themselves uh, will have a great advantage because there's a lot of those around in the ocean. That's led to the idea that is popularly called kill the winner, that any time a bacteria uh, or a microbial species might evolve to be able to become incredibly dominant in the ocean and wipe out other um, microbes around it through competition, that viruses will evolve the ability to attack and destroy that particular kind of microbe. Well, as that population, as that interaction goes along, uh, the host becomes less and less and less common as the virus attacks it. At some point, it becomes so uncommon in the ocean that the viral particles coming from one host have a difficult time finding another host because they're so far apart from one another. And at that point, the infectivity of that virus drops, the infection rate lowers, and the death rate from the virus lowers. So we've identified other species which, uh, as predators, control a species that is so competitively dominant that um, if it's let get too abundant, it reduces uh, the diversity of life all around it. And those are called keystone species. The first one uh, that was identified is the starfish Pisaster ochracius uh, on the coasts of Washington State, uh, where it eats California mussels, Middleus californianus. Now that mussel uh, is a competitively dominant grower. Without being held in check by its predator, it grows all up and down the, the coastal rocks, out competing other animals and plants that might be able to grow there. The starfish, Pisaster, by eating that mussel um, specifically, uh, releases 
the whole area from competition from this competitively dominant mussel species and actually increases the diversity of different species on rocky shores. Um, Sea otters have also been called keystone species uh, by eating sea urchins and abalone that consume kelp. Uh, the sea otters keep the herbivores down in population size and allow the kelp forest to grow. When sea otters were hunted to near extinction in the 1800s, the sea urchin populations in particular exploded and kelp forests were chewed down to their, their bare nubs. Uh, another example on land is the relationship between uh, wolves, say in Yellowstone National Park, and uh, the plant species and the forest species around uh, the rivers and streams in Yellowstone. Um, the relationship there is that uh, wolves change the behavior of the elk in the park. Uh, they change their behavior and where they feed, and they reduce the population of grazers. And by doing that, the release from grazing allows the plant populations to grow up in areas that it otherwise wouldn't be growing uh, when there weren't any wolves in, in Yellowstone. So all of these species, as keystones, change the nature of the community uh, that they are, are living in. So viruses might be a kind of predator like that, a keystone species that attacks the abundant microbes that might grow up in the ocean without, uh, without their presence. So kill the winner is something that's a hypothesis for how uh, the competitively dominant microbes that might otherwise be there are held in check. Um, it's a dynamic process where one or other of these microbes might be released uh, from competition or they might be able to take over some part of the ocean uh, like we saw off the coast of England or on the northern coast of Turkey, um, only to be held in check by viruses that evolve the ability uh, to attack them. Uh, that isn't a, a proven dynamic in the world's ocean, but it fits in what we know from other ecosystems about the dynamics between predator and prey, and it explains one of the sort of mysteries of microbial diversity, which is why there are so many different kinds of microbes all across the world's oceans, and why none of them seems to be taking over the whole, the whole globe. 